The first story is what we call the bucket story, and this highlights the importance of proper titling of your assets. I can create a bucket, so pretend my little cup here is a bucket. It is a bucket in a way, it's just a very small bucket. Mm -hmm. Can't do a lot with it, but hold a cup of water. So if I need to do some cleanup around the yard and I, my old bucket is worn out or rusted uh, or the dog chewed it up or whatever, if it was plastic, something like that. So I go to the local hardware store, go to Goshen Hardware and I'll buy a new bucket. I take it home, I put it on my shelf until I need it. But sitting on my shelf, does it really have any real utility or value sitting on that shelf? What what do I have to do to the bucket to make it earn its keep, for lack of a better description? And how do I use it? How do I put it into use? You have to put something into it, correct? So we have to create our bucket, which in our example is our estate plan. Right? That is the bucket we're referring to, the analogy. But it's not enough to just have the documents created. We have to fill the bucket up. So when we do an estate plan, we have to make sure that we retitle your assets name the appropriate beneficiary so that everything flows into that bucket, which in this case is likely going to be a trust, or it could be a, could be a, a lifetime trust, we call a living trust. It could be a trust created under a will too. It doesn't have to be just a living trust. But we have to make sure that the bucket is filled either during lifetime or the beneficiary will pour, designation will, re, will force those assets into that bucket when we pass away. So that's important. The second story is the babysitter story. This story will uh, highlight the importance of properly updating your estate plan on a regular basis. So I'm going to turn this over to Austin for a moment as an expert babysitter. We say, right. that, we, we say that jokingly. No, I'm 34 and I haven't changed a diaper yet, so mm. uh, one but, day it'll happen. But he's good at telling the babysitter <laughs> story, so I'll let him take over on that. Okay. I, I do take my friend's kids to movies sometimes, if that counts for anything, but no, no uh, real serious babysitting. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's imagine a young couple gets married, has their first kid. After a couple months, three months, whatever it is, four months, I don't know because I don't have any kids that I know of yet, mm -hmm. um, they are able to give the kid to some babysitter, whether it be a family member or you know a close friend or something, and able to go and try to have a nice meal, presumably fall asleep in their plates, something like that. What do they leave with the babysitter? And yeah, the baby, but what else do they leave with the babysitter? All right. So they leave like a list with information, right? Which has what, phone numbers? What else does it have on it? Location. Yeah. Where they're going to be, what time will be home. Okay. Like when to feed the baby, what to feed the baby. In fact, did we put this on here? Yeah, you have your list. Is it? Okay, so. We'll save that for afterwards. Yeah, instructions. Oh, yeah. Um, well, we could put it up. Yeah. Just Hi. Slide the next. This is my list. I can't read it very well. When, yeah, I, you know, the scanning job wasn't great, but um, I took a picture of it with my phone. A couple of years, I've been, you know, telling this story for five years now. And a couple of years ago, on uh, Mother's Day, my grandmother came to my parents' house and brought a scrapbook. And it, ha it had the list that my mother gave her when she left me with them, you know, 33 years ago, or 30, 34, you know, 33 and a half years ago, whatever yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, waking up at 5, 5.30, six ounce bottle, uh, His mother a must have been a, is, is cereal, a real, a real, you know, a real, real detail oriented person, I'll tell you. She cared. She had it down to a science. Yeah. That's what we but, this with her. Yeah, she exactly. I was, was her firstborn, you know, she wasn't messing around. Yeah. Um, you know, around. Three yeah. three thirty is my six ounce bottle of bourbon. <laughs> yeah. uh, I had a cigar at four. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sure. no, but so I thought that was cool. I figured we put it in the presentation. <laughs> I like this. Like, he uh, went he went to bed at six. Oh my god! Oh my gosh! According to her, I was the greatest. I you know went to bed early, stayed asleep. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what happened, but you know yeah. I used to be good. Uh, <laughs> my girlfriend wouldn't say that. She anyway. Um, so we have the list. Fast forward 10 years. 10 year olds, uh, from what I understand, are not some, you know, ch the age that you'd be leaving them home alone. So let's say the parents want to go out for dinner or something like that. Uh, they get a babysitter for their kid, right? They should. Does the list look at all the same as it did 10 years prior? No. What, what few things have changed? You're probably not going to bed at six anymore. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. 
That could be changing. Yeah, so the kid has changed quite a bit. Maybe, you know, the, the parents' lives have changed. They have different phone numbers or something like that. You know, it's a different restaurant they're going to to leave a phone number for the restaurant, too. Um, the babysitter, presumably, is different. Or maybe it's not, and maybe the only thing they're leaving with the babysitter is a, is a brief update with the, with, of the list. You know, oh, well, here's the restaurant's phone number. You already have hours. You already know how to handle a kid. A lot of different ways you could slice that. So let's rewind again back to when the kid is born. What's another kind of a list in a way or a set of instructions that parents get done after their first or after they have children, usually? List of instructions? A more formal legal list. Yeah. Ones that we might help them with. Guardianship? Well, yeah. we got it. Well, with the guardian right. being the primary and, and, focus. And you kind of like, exactly, you're, you're going to my next issue. What's their, their primary concern is who who's going to take care of, of the child. <laughs> um, so you want to name a guardian in the will. Um, so let's fast forward 10 years. Do you think they've updated that, that set of instructions? No. no. Let's fast forward 20 years. Do you think they've updated that set of instructions? You know, I've seen them as old as you can. I think, I don't know the oldest I've seen, maybe 40, you know, yeah, really. Like, I've seen, 70s, I know I've seen yeah, yeah. wills that are older than I am. So, you know, that's something. Um, chances are their lives have changed. The set of instructions has changed. Their financial picture, their children, their family, whatever has changed. I, you know, I've, 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 when I'm doing this updating with people, you know, who've come in to see us for the first time, I'll look at their existing will, and the, the laugh goes, yeah, you know, my ex-sister-in-law is the guardian for our kids. You know, I haven't spoken to her in 20 years now because you know, she's remarried now 15 years, that kind of thing. Can I ask you a question? Of course. Pulled through to, uh, illegally? I think you know, so, right? It? An ex-sister-in-law? In other words, if you make something out now and then 20 years from now, like we're just talking about the babysitter, Mm -hmm. Does that hold legally? Yes. Yeah. Still, it's still legal? a legally enforceable yep. instrument. The only, ex the, on the only exception to that divorce. is like if you're married and you do wills together, and then you get divorced, they treat your prior spouse as having predeceased you. So you know. But it still but may for provide for else, yeah, for, yeah. for yeah. in-laws you may have had a falling out with. Too yeah. bad. They're going to be. They're still it. Yep. Yeah. So. So the point of this is you, you, you can't just rely on your original set of instructions, yeah. and you can't case. just wait. You can't just decide when you're going to come in to do estate planning and, and, and to maintain it because no one wants to do it, right? No one wants to spend the time, the treasure, or otherwise to do this. So if, you know, just like you don't like going to the dentist necessarily, but you know you need to do it for your, keep your teeth in your mouth, right? Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that through the planning process that as your situation changes, as the laws change, as our experience changes, your planning is kept up to date. We're going to talk more after the break about the updating program. Um, and before we take our break, we'll spend another five minutes and we'll take our break. Another form of contractual ownership is a trust. We're going to do a little teaser about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Trusts are the bread and butter of, a, of a general estate planning practice because we do trusts in everything we do. We do them in our wills. We do them as living trusts. We do them as revocable trusts. We do them as irrevocable trusts. And we're going to go into the little differences of that. This, this uh, slide represents a revocable living trust. A trust is simply a contractual arrangement. When you open a bank account, John Smith and Trust for Robert Smith, that is a contractual instrument. You're signing a little card with the bank that creates a contract that the bank is going to honor your dispositive wishes. Now, this is just a little more formal, lengthier contract that you're <coughs> doing with your own personal lawyer to create a more comprehensive trust that not only deals with your bank accounts presumably but other assets that you own. So then would you so would you define a will as a contract? Will is not a contract. Not a contract. It is a statutory instrument. Okay. Um, so <laughs> that is an exception to that. One of the advantages of a trust among others is that if you do a will in New York it won't necessarily be honored under the law say Florida because it, they have different execution con, uh, uh, requirements. Florida requires witnesses and a notary. New York only requires witnesses, for example. A trust as a contractual instrument is entitled under the United States Constitution to what's called full faith and credit. So a contract entered into New York is valid in Florida or Alaska or, mm -hmm. or you know, uh, South Dakota. It doesn't matter. So this trust, the revocable trust, there are really two flavors of trust. There's revocable trust and irrevocable trust. There are many varieties of irrevocable trust. One that we will talk about tonight uh, after the break is the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, one, the most common one we use. But a, uh, there are other types. There's charitable trust. 
There's supplemental needs trust for disabled beneficiaries. Uh, there's um, um, charitable trust. Life insurance trust. Life insurance trust, trust that's know, the other one. The Cupert I mentioned earlier is a type of irrevocable trust. Right. I mean, they go, you know. We're not going to talk about any of those. That's, yeah. Or else we'll be here we're for five hours rather than three hours, right? And you'll be asleep by the end, I promise. But, so the, the main trust we're doing here is the revocable trust. And the revocable trust is a bucket. So it's the, this is our bucket here. We're going to create our bucket. It's going to hold our assets during our lifetime and have instructions to take care of ourselves and our loved ones under the definition of estate planning. The person creating the trust is what we call a trust maker. Many documents call it the grantor, but that's you know, sort of old-fashioned language in our view. Trust maker is the one creating the trust. That would be you if you're doing it. Believe it or not, we try to dispense with the legalese as much as possible. Correct. You know. You're going to have to you know, deal with a little bit of it. We can't avoid it, but some of it we can, and that's where right. it's one place we can. The person who's in charge of operating the trust during your lifetime is called the trustee, and it could be more than one person. And the people who can benefit can be charities too, but the people or charities, institutions who can benefit from the trust during your lifetime are the beneficiaries. So think about this. You're creating a trust during lifetime as the trust maker. Who do you think would be the person or persons who would be the trustees while you're alive and well? No, not us. Yeah, yeah. I don't want that job. Who else? Remember our definition of estate planning? Yeah. I want to control my property while I'm alive and well? That should be a chip so off. It's you. It's you. Yeah. You're going to be the trustee. You're going to be the trustee. If you're married, who else might be your co-trustee? Spouse. Spouse, probably, right? Mm -hmm. Very often the case. So you can be, um, you can be the trust maker and the trustee. In fact, it almost always is going to be the mm -hmm. case, yes. Okay. In a revocable trust. Now, some irrevocable trust, yeah. that would not be the case. Only with the fancier tax planning ones can, can yeah. you not be for tax planning. Right, purposes, but right. That's and who, who are the people who you're going to say can benefit from your assets during your lifetime while you're alive and well? Could be your children. And even before <laughs> that. You're still alive, right? Yourself. Yourself. Mm -hmm. right. It's my bucket. I can take whatever I want out of my bucket, right? Mm -hmm. And I can also, if I feel like it, give some to my wife, right? And I can take care of my kids. If she tells you to. I can take care of kids. I can. Anyway, you can put whoever you want as a beneficiary because who gets to make the decisions? You do as the trustee. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. That's a living trust. That's a living trust, right? Yep. While you're alive and well. It's a revocable living trust. You can have irrevocable living trust so, too, and we'll talk about that. Correct. So even though you get to, you know, you're really in control and you do everything you want with your property, upon your death, who owns the property? Do you own it at that point? Who does? You're playing guitar with Hendrix. You don't own anything. You're the trustee. Well, yeah, technically the trustee, but the trust is the instrument that owns it. So are those assets probatable assets at that point? The answer is no, because it's in the trust. Remember, probate only applies to individually owned assets. If it's owned in a revocable trust, is it, do I own it anymore? No. Do I control it though? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you get the best of both worlds. I get to control it and I don't own it so it's not a probable asset when I die. Mm -hmm. That's one of the appeals of this instrument, right? Is that we get to avoid probate but in a way that makes sense. And you control it by, uh, by what was put into the, the documents or anything? Correct. The instructions the that are contained in there mm -hmm. will, will control that. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a nice 10-minute uh, break. So let's take a full 10 minutes here, stretch your legs, get some refreshments, use the restroom, and then we'll pick up. And we're going to talk about the progression of the trust and get into uh, some Medicaid planning and then talk about our process in our office. So mm -hmm. thanks for being really attentive so far. We're going to pick this up uh, a little after 4.30. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think we'll uh, get the show on the road again. Thanks for uh, sticking that out with us here. So we talked about the sort of the basics of the revocable trust structure on the front end here. So what happens, uh, well, husband and wife, we talked about, traditionally we would do separate husband and wife revocable trust. We're doing more and more joint revocable trust planning uh, because with the change in the estate tax rules and not having to do as much estate tax planning, not that you can't do estate tax planning within a single trust, but it is more complicated to administer after the first death, in our opinion. But without, when, in most cases, when we don't have to really worry about estate tax planning anymore, especially with the increase in the New York State estate tax exemption, uh, doing a joint trust is, is simpler in most cases, um, especially for funding. So we get a general idea from it here, but you know everybody's case is different, but so you'll, we'll see mm -hmm. how it uh, 
Out. Right, but whether it's a joint trust or a separate trust, the spouses are almost always going to be co-trustees with each other. Again, there's some exceptions if one spouse is some you know, dementia already, or it is a, a you know they're they're a separate you know blended marriage, sep second or third marriage, and they have separate economic lives. Then they may just be their own trustee. Again, case by case basis. This slide really represents sort of the life cycle of the trust plan. We have the husband and wife separate trust in this example, again, during the alive and well phase, they're co-trustees. But what happens, and this goes back to our definition, if the uh, spouse <coughs> becomes incapacitated, the first, uh, either spouse, in this case, where we always pick on the husband, sorry there, Ron, we always do that. Husband is disabled or incapacitated. Mm -hmm. You know, life and death is a fairly determined event, a defined event. With a six exception, I like to use weekend at Bernie's where the guy, you know, they thought was alive, but he was really dead. Uh, Austin likes the zombie apocalypse uh, example. Uh, but in any event, with those relatively uh, unusual Narrow examples. Narrow exceptions. Narrow yeah. exceptions. You're either alive or you're dead. Not a hard thing. But disability or incapacity is not always clear cut. We have many times, you've probably seen this in your own personal lives, you know, whether it's with a parent or a sibling or spouse. Uh, where uh, the, the person is in a decline, but you don't know exactly when the right day is that they are no longer able to manage their affairs. Mm -hmm. So to and help... Often, well, often it isn't, you know, the fine point in time. Mm -hmm. Good days, bad days. Correct. Some yeah. days when they're the elusive and can't express themselves, think, you know, it's... Yeah, and right. Right. So we use a, we have a disability panel because if you have no planning in place, and there's a period of time where someone is dangerous to themselves, either financially or, or from a, a physical standpoint, the only legal uh, option is to file a guardianship, which is a New York State governed under uh, what's called Article 81 of the Mental Hygiene Law. And that's a very formal legal process. You have to file a petition and serve all kinds of people, and it's a very big mess, right? And you're being ultimately adjudicated by a judge who most likely you've never met in your life. Wouldn't it be better to have a group of people who know you and have known you forever to make a decision that your bad days now outweigh your good days? Mm -hmm. And who would most likely be as part of a, a typical disability panel, might you think? Children. Children, and who else? Spouse. Spouse. Doctors. Right. Mm -hmm. A doctor, typically, your, we call it your attending physician. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can say, I have my spouse, my two kids, and my doctor. If they all say I've lost it, I may not agree. And we have cases, I'm dealing with one of family. I did a, 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 a plan for a woman back in 2006. Now her kids came to me just uh, um, on uh, Friday. And you know we went through a scenario where it looks like they're going to have to bring in the disability panel. She's starting to be uh, you know, a little dangerous to herself. But they say she's very resistant. And so I say, yeah, listen, she may not agree to take away her authority, but when we did this planning in 2006, she agreed that if you all agree with her doctor that she's no longer able to, to manage her affairs, then, then that's the rule. And that's so how it works. So in other words, that's built into this uh, particular yes. vehicle? That Correct. Disability, that whole disability aspect is addressed in this uh, revocable living trust? That's, that's correct. What you're and that's what really, one of the things, I'll get to your point in a second, that's what really helps set us uh, apart as, as a benefit over the will. A will only deals with your assets at what time? When you're dead. It has nothing to do with incapacity. Here we have a, an actual customized process that you create, you know, with our assistance, to make sure the right people are making the right call at the right time. Can, just one doctor can make a decision on, on a disability? Like they that? could, and, and unfortunately a lot of sort of the boilerplate trust agreements we see say if, if, if a doctor says I'm disabled, doesn't say what doctor it is, your kid may have it out for you and they hire some their best friend who's a doctor who signs a certificate. One, one right. Person. right, but that's not what we're talking about here. Here it's a group of people. has to be as many people as you want to incorporate into the decision making we always like to have a physician part the of this. Counts, then. Correct. That's what okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And don't you think? As long as you want them to. Right. <laughs> right. And doesn't that seem more comfortable for most people? Yeah. I, I think you would probably agree mm -hmm. with that, right? Mm -hmm. So either you have a period of incapacity or not, and, and of course, if the panel has said you are incapacitated based on whatever terms you set up, then you will have a disability trustee or trustees who will then take over from you. 
if you're married, it's probably going to be your spouse initially. If, if, if either that spouse is incapacitated or you're a widow or a single person, it'll be probably one or more children. When I say probably, <coughs> because you may, during the counseling process, we discuss all your children, and we, we may mutually agree none of them are suitable for doing this, mm -hmm. either because they're too far away, they're too busy, or they're not capable because they're very bad with money. All these kind of things come up. And so then we have to find someone else or a financial institution like a trust company. We can come up with a solution in this context. And then what happens, you either have a period of disability or not. You're going to die at some point, right? And so at the first death, we're going to allocate assets not directly to the surviving spouse or even to a revocable trust, but into some other form of trust, uh, typically what's called a marital trust or in rarer cases to a family trust. Um, and the next slide I think sort of breaks out the, we have a little formula that we call a Clayton election. We should spend a lot more time on this section because of the estate tax implications. We're not going to really spend a lot of time on it here today. Bottom line is, unless you have a large estate, meaning five million and up, it's almost no, this, uh, this family trust is never going to be funded uh, at all. It's yeah. going to all Those go to the marital trust. <laughs> yeah, not too much worry about that. Uh, if you have a taxable state, we'll deal with that as we go to it. But most often the assets are going to go into a marital trust for the surviving benefit, uh, the, uh, surviving spouse's benefit. Why, why to this marital trust rather than going to the surviving spouse's assets? Because we want to make sure if we're the one who goes first, we're on that cloud, we want our spouse to have use and access of these assets in most cases, right? So we go to this one. We want the spouse to have access to these assets and be even the trustee. But if they were to remarry, we want to often put some kind of control on that. Say, hey, if my spouse, you know, you know, go full head over here with some schlub and decides to give him all of her assets, that's her business. I can't stop that. But darn it, she's going to do it with my assets. So we're going to tie up this trust and say, if my spouse remarries, for example, and does not have a a, a prenuptial agreement in effect that would effectively bar that, that other spouse from exercising that right of election, because you can waive it, but it's got to be done in either a prenuptial or postnuptial agreement. We want to build some controls, because if you're on your cloud, you can't control what they do, except for what you've done during your lifetime. And that's what this is all talking about here. And another way of putting it, too, is that it, it, it often isn't about necessarily um, you know, saying, well, you know, I don't want them to get remarried, so I'm going to do this to try to prevent that. It's not that. It's giving them a sort of a, a hook to hang their hat on. So the conversation, instead of having to be the awkward, well, you know, we probably should have a prenup, is the, listen, you know, this is, you know, my, my first husband, God bless him, you know, uh, this is the way things were set up in order to protect our assets for our kids. So what we have to do pursuant to the, the trust it's just do a prenup saying that you know those are sort of off the table if something should happen between us, and that's a much uh, I would like to think. I mean, you know, obviously I'm not in a remarriage position, um, but it seems like a much better conversation to have than just sort of I don't trust you. I think we're going to get divorced at some point. But you know, legally, you don't mm -hmm. need to bring this the second spouse into the trust, right? It can it, that that you just mentioned a conversation. There's no legal. There's no legal um, <coughs> reason for, bring, for bringing this person into the trust. It could just be left. In other words, I'm thinking, would it even have to be mentioned at all? Well, in a way, you're right, because legally, the, the, a, oh. if your spouse remarries without prenup and they get divorced, their, their spouse <laughs> protected? Would, would not have access to this. What we're really doing in the remarriage is, is making sure by forcing, forcing that surviving spouse to have that conversation, the prenup should effectively waive not only these assets for the, from that new spouse, but also the surviving spouse's assets in the event of divorce. Because yeah. you're almost always going to have a prenup that says, whatever we came into our marriage with be, remains ours. And so this, this fosters yeah. that easier conversation, which is all too often not done. Because having a conversation about a prenup, even for people you know, 50, 60 years old getting married, can be a difficult conversation. Look, I have a financial advisor I do a lot of work with. He's a very intelligent guy, a great guy. I refer to a lot of people to him. He's 
late 30s, 38, 39, getting married for the first time, mm -hmm. just to, it's not the new, the new freedom. Yeah, we have a guy. You know, he's got a reasonable you know, amount of money, and he knows, and he was in my, in my office talking about it with our family law yeah. attorney, and he just kind of... Uh, Same thing with are the light. Are you uh, saying that but you would suggest that for him? Absolutely. Do we have Sure. Is that you would oh, you suggest that yeah. for everyone? Or just someone with sizable assets? You know, I mean, I think you I gotta mean, have something to protect, but... have prenuptial Not necessarily in that case. Yeah, right. You're right, because they don't have no, much... No, I'm, I'm not challenging you. I'm just No, no, it's a fair call. It. Yeah, that's less likely necessary. Right. Uh, with a 22-year-old, I would think that you would need one, depending on what they were going to inherit down the road. But that's a little different. Sometimes, well, so with our planning, you don't have to worry about it. we get a hold of the parents and do planning for them, that where the child that. doesn't have to worry about it. Wouldn't mind yeah. belt and suspenders in it, certainly, but, yeah. you know, glad you mentioned it, not us, saying, Here, here's more legal work that you guys do. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know. What about someone who's living with somebody for years and years? How do they figure it out? That's a good question huh? about how living well. Are they considered spouse? Uh, generally no. not in New York, not New York yeah. but there are some exceptions. New York doesn't generally... There's no length of time then, right? No. In a way. New York doesn't recognize common law marriage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. However, there are cases, I was involved in one about 25 years ago, where you can, if you are in a, what we would normally consider a common law marriage in New York, which doesn't recognize it, but let's say you go to Pennsylvania on vacation. You spend a week in a hotel, and you sign the register as Mr. and Mrs. Jones, even though you're not Mr. and Mrs. Jones. This is actually the case that happened, right? Yes, right. Yeah. This is a case we're involved in. You come back to New York, then the husband died. Mr. Jones dies. The, the, the widow, who's not really a widow, doesn't get anything under law, right? We were able, in our case, we represented this woman to show that because they went to Pennsylvania on vacation, and the case law is very clear. If you, if you hold yourself out as husband and wife in a state that recognizes common law marriage, even if you have never married in New York, you can still come, could be deemed a surviving spouse and exercise that spousal uh, so right. You guys around. put that down anyway. I mean. yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, there's a lot of, it's not that clear cut. I don't want to get off track on that. Right, right. Right. But the other thing that's valuable. Does that mean they get a slice of the pie? Yeah, that's a good point. The other thing that's valuable, let's say there's never a marriage, but let's say the surviving spouse is, you know, the, let's say the husband was the one who always paid the bills and handled it, and the wife never really figured all that out. She forgets to pay the car insurance premium. And someday she gets an accident, serious injuries to the other driver, finds out she's not insured, gets sued for a million dollars, two million dollars. Well, her own assets, going back to this picture here, her own assets, whether in a revocable trust or in her own name, are, are fair game. But the assets that have passed into the fam marital trust, or in the rare case, the family trust, are protected against creditors, because these are considered irrevocable trusts and are free from the claims of creditors of the surviving spouse. So even if there's never a remarriage issue, you're adding additional legal protections that is otherwise not available if she is the surviving owner. All right. So let's move ahead to now we've dealt with if you're a married couple, how do you plan for the spouse? And we're going to deal with how the, how the assets will pass to your kids. Okay. So the idea here is, and we kind of touched on it earlier, but you know, we're going to talk about it in more detail, is well, the kind of um, thing you're, you're, how do I put it? The earth shattering concept you're going to have to think about is that ownership, or let me put it this way. Control and access, that's what we normally think of when we think of ownership. I want to be the owner of this because I want to have control over it. I want to use it for what I want to use it for. I want to be able to access it when I want to <laughs> access it, so I want to be the owner. Well, you don't have to be the owner of something to have full control and full access over it. So when we talk about an, a beneficiary, whether it be a child or whoever else it might inherit from you, uh, getting the inheritance, you presumably want them to have full control and full access, but they don't have to be the owner to do that. And by the way, there are a bunch of benefits to not being the owner. Right. Before we get to the ultimate disposition, this just visually shows you sort of the, the, the natural progression of assets, either from the marital and family trust of the deceased spouse and then the second to die. All the assets will flow down to child one, child two in this example. Yeah, we're not talking about 
three, four different trusts for the kids. We're talking about one for each. Right. And that's what we're talking about. Is here's the sort of um, the spectrum of options you have as far as a child or a beneficiary inheriting from you. Um, over on my right, your left, we have the outright <coughs> kind of options. Uh, lump sum, meaning just you know, you're administering the estate, and if it's my family, they write a check to me, Austin F. Du Bois. And I just go and put that in my bank account. Um, phases and stages, that's stuff like, uh, you know, they have the first half at 25, and then the second half at 30, or stages, it's rare, but you see it, something like graduating high school, buying a house, getting married, that sort of thing. But what's common between all of them is that they're getting it right, outright, in their own name. And the way I sort of explain this, the way I like to explain it, is it's like a toothpaste, I use a toothpaste in a tube analogy. So say I'm going on vacation with my girlfriend, um, which I am in March, and Michael almost uh, ruined the surprise last night. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, anyway, Good. I digress. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she says, you know, honey, I forgot my, I forgot my toothpaste. Can I have some? And I say, sure. So she holds out her hand, and then I just squeeze all the toothpaste out into her hand. Okay. First of all, she'll probably smack me upside the head with that. What a, but, what a guy. Yeah. Now, I've given her the toothpaste, right? And she can, she can use it, but it's hard for her to protect it herself, you know, to preserve it for the future, even though she does have immediate access to it and full control. She probably would have much rather I just gave her the tube of toothpaste. Or in a situation where we're talking multiple kids, their own individual tubes of toothpaste. They're the one holding on to it. And they're the one taking the cap off and, and using it whenever they need to, but you've given it to them in a way where it's protected. They don't have to do anything more for it to be protected. And that's what like a lifetime protective trust is. Uh, when we do our planning, when we're talking about anything resembling real money, the beneficiaries are getting it in a trust share, you know, their own trust share, they don't have to talk to their siblings about it or anything like that, that they control. Now, of course, if you don't want them to have full control, that's fine too. My sort of purpose in saying all this is saying, look, they can have full control and have it still be protected in trust. If you don't want them to have full control, we do do that too, you know, on occasion that does come up. Uh, sometimes it is in their best interest. Um, we have what we call a conservative lifetime trust. The idea is they would, um, they would not be their own trustee in that case. When it's their own trust and they have full access and control, that means they're the trustee, they call the shots. Um, if you don't feel that they are responsible enough to call the shots. I dealt with a case once where um, it was a woman who was leaving money to her sister and her sister's husband was overbearing about finances. So even though her sister was fairly responsible, she didn't want to leave it to her to be fully controlled because you know she just <laughs> buy her husband a Ferrari with her or something like that. Um, the idea is we can restrict it more if you want to. Finally, on the on the farthest end of the spectrum is a special needs trust. So you have somebody that's going to be inheriting from you that's eligible for government benefits due to some sort of disability. They just aren't allowed legally to have control over it, even though they might very well be able to do so. One of my longtime <coughs> clients has spina bifida, and his dad set up a supplemental needs trust for him because, because of the spina bifida, he's eligible for government benefits. The guy's an actor out in California. I mean, he, he's fine. You know, he, he's mentally smarter than most people. Um, but because of the fact that he stays eligible for government benefits, uh, he's got a slip on the needs trust that he got inherited from his father. That's a good time to interject about, sort of bring us back to our cloud story about why things don't work. You know, sometimes, of course, talking about like the case in Austin with the spina and a bifida uh, client, we know that person has a disability at the time we're doing the planning. But many times you're leaving for a child and, and it could be years after you die that they develop some form of disability or have a catastrophic accident. At that point, if they've inherited everything in their name, those assets they have are going to potentially and likely cause them to be ineligible for government benefits until they spend down their money and have no money left. Then they get on Medicaid or SSI. If we set up a lifetime protective trust that says if they're, you know, if they are um, really response, or, or, you know, we're going to give them full control and access, as Austin mentioned, but we always put in a proviso, a contingent supplemental needs trust that says if at any time after the establishment of a trust for any beneficiary, that beneficiary it becomes disabled or is otherwise qualifies as a special needs person, in that case, then their trust will automatically convert into a supplemental needs trust that is funded with $1 or $10 million, it doesn't matter, 
not a single dollar in that trust will count against their eligibility for mm -hmm. government assistance. Mm -hmm. But if they've already had the toothpaste squeezed in their hand, you can't put it back in the tube <coughs> to become eligible for government for uh, a supplemental needs trust. Okay, and the way that lifetime differs from the conservative is that the lifetime, right at the outset, the beneficiary is controlling, whereas in the conservative, you could say the beneficiary would never control it. Correct. Right, exactly. You can set those limits. And, and you can do hybrids, too, by the way. This really is a continuum. <laughs> I've done some that are sort of in between here where um, the parents wanted the, the beneficiary to have control over some assets, say like 5% of their inheritance a year, but then have the rest not have access to. You know, mm -hmm. so. It depends, again, it's a case-by-case -case scenario. Can the, uh, can, can the specification be even as specific as what the funds could be utilized for? Sure. It can be, yeah. Yes, it can, you can be that So specific. it could be specified like for, say, Education home, house, only? Yeah. Or, yeah. Home like we have, I have clients I'm doing that for right now. It's um, primarily for, for household <laughs> stuff and, like, a car. Or education. And then there's a little, like, stipend that they're getting, yeah.